So we're going to move right away to the last speaker on this panel, who is Mashal Sohail, um, who is an associate professor at the Center for Genomic Sciences at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. Thank you so much, Michelle, for being with us. Great, thank you, Anne. Can you see me? Um, yes, we can see yourself. Yep. Uh -huh. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for the committee. It's a real honor to speak here today, and I will be speaking today um, about the population descriptors in genomics research through the case study of the Mexican Biobank. We've been hearing a lot about um, race and ethnicity and these descriptors, and mainly in the context of the U.S., so here we get a chance to explore it in a different context of, of Mexico. Um, so this uh, Biobank, the Mexican Biobank, uh, started in Dr. Andres Moreno Estrada's lab at Simestad Lengevio as a collaboration with the National Institute of Public Health in Mexico and to uh, genotype samples that were collected by the Institute as part of their year 2000 uh, National Health Survey. And uh, it, it ended up being a collaboration with the University of Oxford and spread out to um, other universities as well. So here I'm showing uh, just the samples that we have, um, about 6,000 samples, just by their uh, latitudes and longitudes and colored by whether they come from a rural or an urban locality. And so these uh, 6,000 samples were picked from the biobank, which was about uh, just about 40,000 individuals and were enriched uh, to have more representation of um, indigenous identities and uh, of rural localities. And I'll speak more about that in this talk. And so we covered all 32 states uh, and about 900 municipalities, and uh, these samples were genotyped uh, on the mega array for about 2 million SNPs. Uh, so I'll talk through this project, uh, keeping in mind these questions that were posed to us uh, for this session, and starting with, in particular, what taxonomies, classification schema, or population descriptors does your program use, and how and why are these used? And two, have your policies surrounding population descriptors changed since the project began? Why or why not? I especially like the second question, since that's definitely something that was uh, my personal experience going through this project. And so this project started the way it was written and funded was uh, to try and find um, associations of genetic variants with different complex traits, complex diseases, also immune response uh, to different pathogens. And to see if we find uh, associations that are specific uh, to different, uh, what you may call ancestral genetic backgrounds, or that may be ancestry specific uh, in some sense. So um, as I go through this, I think it's great to uh, come after these great set of talks and to really keep in mind some of the things that were brought up, especially in Graham Goop's talk and uh, um, also in Alice Popejoy's talk. So genetic ancestry is, is, is something that, you know, as we, we as this come up, it's, it can be considered a little poorly defined, but is, is a way to think of similarities between individuals uh, depending on their near and distant ancestors and has been conceptualized using common techniques such as principal component analysis and admission. So with the, the initial goal of the project, uh, that's what we do. And I'll start by just uh, showing this, uh, which has come up in many ways, but just a visual representation that ancestry or ancestry is your, is your path uh, through your ancestral recombination graph and can be, uh, conceptualize at any different time size, right? So um, we've been focusing on this particular time size, but it's really, you can have it here or here, you can have it um, further back. And so uh, we'll keep that in mind. And you know, being part of uh, this uh, Harvard University Software Center's ethics, uh, for Ethics Working Group on ancestry and population really helped uh, me sort of try uh, to move the analysis towards this idea of ancestry being a continuous and multidimensional concept. And so we start by just looking uh, uh, using dimension reduction, using a principal component analysis to look at our Mexican biobank samples. And here they are shown in gray. Um, and towards what we're, uh, towards the close of at least uh, this manuscript, uh, we decided to, um, in terms of labeling, only uh, put the names of specific, some specific groups and where uh, they were sampled from uh, in this set of references. And with respect to coloring them, uh, we decided to color them uh, based on uh, the clusters that come out of this other approach of conceptualizing genetic ancestry, which is admixture. And so the admixture analysis basically assumes uh, that there are different, there are distinct ancestry clusters that can be uh, computed from any given set of samples. And of course, it depends on exactly the samples you put into the analysis, which you get. But this is shown here at k equals five. 
And um, with that assumption in mind, some of the things we can pick up is that, for example, ancestry, genetic ancestry that's predominantly found uh, in the Americas um, tends to increase in Mexico as we move south and southeast, uh, and vice versa is true for ancestry that's predominantly found in Europe, the Middle East, and South Asia, though through historical sources likely came to Mexico um, from uh, Western Europe, from Spain. And so a big question also becomes with respect to all the conversations we're having is also how to name these clusters that come out of these uh, admixture analysis. And so one of the things uh, with respect to moving towards uh, trying to make ancestry not seem uh, such an essentialized entity is to, even though we're getting out one cluster to refer to it as ancestries instead of ancestry, since even though this may be purple color is, is predominant in East Asia, it's actually reflecting several ancestries and not just a single ancestry. And with, with respect to naming commonly, these have been referred as follows, as native ancestries or European ancestries, but in the manuscript, um, we actually decided to, uh, name it as for ancestries from, uh, for example, Central America or ancestries from uh, Western Europe, again, uh, to try to uh, de-essentialize the concept and to case it sort of at a particular time scale in a particular uh, geographic region. And so another thing we do is, uh, now going with respect to geographic resolutions to uh, use anthropological and archeological context uh, to regionalize Mexico. So here in, uh, for example, the North of Mesoamerica, the North of Mexico, uh, the Occident and Gulf of Mexico, the center, Haka and the Mayan region. And uh, to do this dimensional reduction exercise just um, on the individuals from Mexico without any other samples and colored by the Mesoamerican region that they come from. And here, uh, this helps to see that uh, in general, we see a substructure that does uh, seem to separate uh, the Yucatan Peninsula from uh, the other uh, regions of the country where we only see a very subtle uh, substructure. And so we can go one step further and uh, the, get this idea of these local ancestries, so where uh, different genomic segments, uh, what parts of the world they come from, or where they show more similarity with, uh, with respect to the other reference samples we put into this analysis. And this uh, leads to the third question of how the program approaches legacy data and what challenges does your program face with managing emerging. So in our particular case, um, uh, the data that we mostly merged with for this study is this native Mexican diversity panel, which may not be considered legacy as such since it's not uh, it's not very old, it's reasonably recent, and is also accessible through a data access agreement similar to the Mexico Biobank project. And so merging these data sets to do analysis is, is actually reasonably straightforward as long as it's for research purposes. And so and so it's again going uh, through a different geographic resolution and now uh, getting these admixture components uh, only using as reference indigenous groups, uh, various indigenous groups within Mexico and, uh, and observing the substructure that comes from these uh, different indigenous groups as well as it's present within them. And similarly, we can uh, place these on top of the principal components uh, plot of the Mexican biobank and see uh, that uh, the indigenous groups from the Mayan region um, do fall predictably uh, and from other regions where we would expect. Um, and now this is important again in terms of thinking about ancestry in terms of different geographic resolutions which represent different time scales. So previously I showed uh, principal components with reference populations from across the world and then only Mexico. So here what we're doing is we can take uh, from the local ancestry analysis only ancestral segments that come from um, that are more native to the to Central America and to uh, use this ancestry specific uh, principal components analysis approach to see uh, where what kind of uh, axes of variation we see with respect to the native diversity. And so these are from the native Mexican diversity panel, the ones that are named. Uh, with respect to the native diversity we see in Mexico, what kind of ancestry variation we see there. And so um, again, with respect to just always uh, conceptualizing ancestry at different scales uh, becoming uh, an important process in the project. And the question of why to do this um, at all in this framework just helped me think about what the, the, the analysis that we're doing in this project and it's in no sense comprehensive is because genetic ancestries will represent uh, certain demographic histories. Uh, right, and these can end up creating patterns in the genome, such as uh, you know how 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 often you see segments of the genome that are in homozygosis, or the distribution, uh, the frequency distribution of different variants in the genome, or how 
diversifying uh, different genomes. And so it's really just a proxy that's capturing those histories because these patterns in the genome may then be relevant for variation that we see for complex traits such as height or, or other diseases that we may be interested in. And so this goes back to just thinking about the peopling of the world and how what makes present Mexico today uh, you know, you have uh, the movement out of Africa and then across the Bering Strait of uh, the natives and then uh, from Europe later on in the colonial period, um, from Asia as well in the colonial period, from Africa. And so that's reflecting different population size histories, uh, which is the reason why we think like using that history proxy might be relevant. And, and we do find that um, in, our, in our analysis. So what we can do is we can look at segments of the genome then that are identical uh, by descent uh, from a common ancestor and overlapping them with these uh, segments of the genome uh, with, uh, with the ancestries in different regions of the world, we can use uh, the IBD to infer uh, population size histories, uh, or as I was talking about from uh, these different um, ancestries per se. And so here we can see that uh, the, the three predominant ancestries that are present in Mexicans do show uh, very different uh, population size histories, and we can interpret them in light of the chronology uh, of Mesoamerica of the of the of the different periods uh, that we have uh, before the colonial period uh, as well as after. And again, uh, doing this at a different resolution, uh, we realize that Mexico again is not at all homogeneous. And so if we repeat this analysis within uh, these different Mesoamerican regions, just for uh, the segments of the genome that are inferred to be most closely related to uh, indigenous groups in Mexico. We find that indeed uh, in different parts of Mexico, we see very different population size histories and these can well, uh, these well reflect what we know from other sources of information from archeology span and anthropology about the civilizational histories um, of these uh, different regions. Uh, and similarly, since the colonization as well was a, a heterogeneous event, uh, this is more and more appreciable. We can see as well if we uh, do this analysis in different regions for ancestries, uh, for segments of the genome that are most similar uh, to groups in Europe. Uh, we also see that they show uh, different uh, population size histories in different uh, regions in Mexico. And uh, the same is uh, also the case for um, uh, where ancestries from West Africa. And so, uh, Going one step further to thinking about segments of the genome and homozygosis or commonly called runs of homozygosity, uh, just closely related uh, to IVD segments. Um, these can again be a window into both uh, demographic uh, and population size histories as well as uh, into mating patterns. And so when we look at these uh, in individuals uh, of, the, of the Mexican biobank by state, again, we see that they're very much show a structure that's patterned uh, by geography, where we see more ROHs uh, and uh, in uh, as we move uh, south and southeast in the country, and that this is uh, correlated uh, again with the proxy of ancestry that we get out of the admixture analysis. Um, so, in particular, uh, that. Uh, the number of ROHs carried by an individual is uh, positively correlated uh, with ancestries from Central America uh, compared to um, uh, the other ancestries found in Mexico where it is uh, negatively correlated. And so uh, other work, for example, this one, which mainly looked at Eurasian uh, populations, uh, found uh, showed that ROH do show associations with several complex traits. And so um, we want to look at this within the context of Mexico. And so just as an example, if you look at a, a trait like height, uh, here we can see that height does increase uh, on average uh, in, in a pretty uh, striking pattern from as we move from south to uh, from southeast to north in the country. And uh, you know we, we were we made sure to also look at the whole distribution of height in these different states uh, to show that while the on average, uh, there's a pattern, the, the distributions are quite overlapping across the different states. And the question is, um, well, what can we try to explain this pattern of variation? And, you know, like how much of it is because of these variation in genetics uh, versus other sorts of variations that we've talked about already in the session? And so a variation in genetics versus uh, the realization of, of course, like the environmental present is correlated with genetic ancestries uh, in various ways because of this colonial and post-colonial context. And this, this could be experience of discrimination or socioeconomic opportunities available or the kind of environment uh, one is living in. And so 
This is, Michelle, uh, just sorry, I'll just hop in one minute to save you one minute left. So okay. if you can wrap up to your most yep, important yep. point. Okay, so what attributes of individuals are important to collect for use in large data sets? So in this case, um, given the framework that I showed, we uh, consider not only uh, these genetic predictors, but also predictors um, of age and sex, but uh, social cultural, uh, such as education attainment as a proxy for socioeconomic status, whether they speak an indigenous language or not as a proxy for experience of discrimination, uh, whether they live in an urban or rural environment, as well as biographical uh, predictors. And so we use ancestry both as inferred from admixture as well as uh, kinds of ancestry within Mexico as inferred from this ancestry specific PCA. And so we can run a mixed model, which is jointly uh, modeling these genetic and uh, environmental factors in a sense to try to account for the other um, and, and see which factors are most important, for example, for height variation where um, ancestry uh, proxies do appear to be important even after accounting, which again might represent those genetic variations or again, uh, unaccounted for um, environmental variables. And, uh, you know, we can do the same thing for other sorts of traits and, and try to get a sense of like, what is the trait profile and what are uh, the important indicators. So- okay. Michelle, I'll give you 30 seconds. Yeah, for I'm, this I'm done. Question. Uh, so I think just in terms of lessons, I think we need to ponder deeply on this question of why a diversified genetic phenotypic is databases are called, you know, something I'm very much for, but it's sort of like where, are we looking for information in the different environments, different ancestries and so on. And that in general, I think what I found really fruitful in this project is uh, great to sample in different environments, um, to always ask questions on collecting data about ethnic and linguistic identity, to be able to do those kinds of analysis, to always question your taxonomies, justify their use, and use different geographic and time scale resolutions and allow these to evolve with the project. And that's fairly straightforward to analyze genetic and environmental factors together. And that's uh, that a direction I think we should be moving in. And just to thank all the individuals who gave their samples as well as the, the whole Mexico Biobank Consortium. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions with the rest of the group. Thank you so much.